Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio program. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today is Idols in Plain Sight. Today we're going to talk about something I've talked about numerous times before, but which needs to be talked about again so I can share with you something shocking. The Lord showed me about it in a dream. I am talking about idolatry and specifically idolizing certain people in our lives. Idolizing anyone or anything is a problem for us as Christians due to the command in Exodus chapter 20, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So let's start by talking about the definition of idolatry. Webster's calls it the worship of idols, as in an image of a god used as an object of worship, or any object of ardent or excessive devotion. Worship of idols or excessive devotion to or reverence for some person or thing. Dictionary.com calls it the religious worship of idols or excessive or blind adoration, reverence, or devotion. What causes idolatry in our lives? Idolatry is what happens in our hearts when we take our eyes off God and begin to look at, adore, believe in, or prefer another source, person, place, or thing to comfort us to take away our pain, to bring us happiness, to fulfill us or provide for us. Our actions reveal to us every day where our faith lies, what we worship. Whatever we give our attention to gains power in our lives over us, whether that is God or some other thing, whether it is a relationship, a fantasy, an addiction, or something as simple as our favorite sports team. Isaiah 44, 18, they have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see in their hearts that they cannot understand. In context, the scripture is talking about the men who used to make idols in Israel. But the truth is, we all make idols. Ours just don't look like little statues. Talking about preferring the comfort of another, a classic case is in Judges. Chapter 16, let's talk about Samson. I'm going to start in verse 15. And she said unto him, this is Delilah, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily, when she nagged with her words, and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Can you say manipulation? That's what Delilah was doing. She was manipulating Samson. She did not love him. She may not have even liked him. She sold him out for 1,100 silver coins to the lords of the Philistines. The signs could not have been more clear when she started questioning him about the secret to his strength. But she was flirting with him in between that to make him think she was just playing around, right? So Samson gave Delilah the wrong answer three times about what it would take to take away his great strength. But she nagged at him every day and he finally gave in. In every one of those three times, she acted on what he told her would render his strength gone. That is what Samson should have realized, that she was doing everything that he was telling her would take away his strength. Why was she doing that if she loved him? So the red flags were blowing furiously in the wind. Delilah's other words to Samson were likely sweet and seductive. That way she could keep him thinking she loved him and keep him cooperating with her since she wanted that payoff from the people in power for giving him over to his enemies. Samson is a classic case of listening to what someone says and ignoring what they do. If you want to know the truth about any relationship, this is a word for somebody 
You have been asking God for the truth about your relationship. The way to find out the truth about any relationship is to ignore the words and look only at the actions. You can write down a list on a pad of paper. On one side, put the words. On the other side, put the actions and lack of actions. And the truth will stare you right in the face. Delilah acted on all three of the wrong answers, which should have shown him that she would not hesitate to take from him or do him harm to get what she wanted. God closed Samson's eyes, according to Isaiah 40, 14, because of the idolatry he was in with Delilah. He was in sin with Delilah. Literally, he closed them. The Philistines, when they captured him, gouged out his eyes. Samson would never again look upon the woman he had fallen for. And that was not all Samson lost, as we know. He lost his reputation, his position, and in the end, his life. Okay, the Lord says this is a word for somebody, a man. You are somewhere near the age of 40, and you are involved with a woman who has clearly demonstrated in her actions that she does not care for you. She cares for herself. But you have chosen to believe her words instead of her actions. The Lord says to you, sir, that if you do not cut ties with that woman, cut off all contact when you hear this, that your complete destruction lies just ahead. And I am seeing death. I don't know if that it will be by your hand or hers, but if it is a life insurance thing or what, but she will be the cause of your death if you do not cut ties right now when you hear this and never talk to her or see her again. And for any of you who are new listeners, how you tell if a word is for you, a word like that that comes during the radio shows, if when you hear that word, if it feels like God is speaking directly to you, then that word is for you. It doesn't matter if it has somebody else's name on it. It does not matter. If you feel like God was speaking to you, that word is for you. Deuteronomy eleven sixteen. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. So idolatry is deception. All sin is deception, by the way. Deuteronomy thirty seventeen. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but thou shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. Verse 18. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. As Dr. Charles Stanley says, whatever has your focus has you. Where your focus is directed is a good indicator of where you are looking for happiness and fulfillment. Wherever you spend most of your free time, energy, and money is a good indicator of where your focus is and where you can find your idols. Whatever sin you do not overcome, that thing will eventually overcome you, by the way. As humans, we were created to worship, so we have a need to worship something or someone. If we do not have a correct relationship with God, we will simply worship something or someone else. It is possible to make an idol out of just about anything or anyone. Many people today idolize, you know, some political idea, or they idolize Oprah, or they idolize some actress or actor. Many idolize success, their own beauty, fame, or wealth. Many idolize a relationship in their lives or a relationship they don't have yet, like a kingdom spouse. That can be a romantic relationship. It can be the relationship you want to have, you know, if you get to get married. Uh, It can be a parent, a child, or a friend. Anything that gets more of our affection and reverence than God does is out of balance in our lives. Can I just say that? We are commanded to have no other gods before Him. Relationships are not bad, but all relationships should be secondary to our relationship with God. Now, here's the true test of idolatry. This is the one that will light up an idol like a neon sign for you and show you where they are. Anything you are willing to compromise your beliefs for or compromise doing what you know God wants you to do for is an idol in your heart. For example, let's say the Lord has told me to move to Santa Fe, New Mexico, but let's say I was in a relationship with somebody in Springfield, Missouri. And I did not want to move and be far away from them. So I refused to go. That would be idolatry because I would be doing what I wanted to do instead of what God wanted me to do. I would be idolizing that relationship. Anything that causes you to break the commandments of God is an idol in your heart. 
So if it causes you to serve it instead of him, bowing down to it, putting another God before him, if it causes you to lie, kill, steal, cheat on your beloved or lust after it, it is an idol. If it takes up all your time or thought should, which should be stayed on him, it is an idol. If you are putting all of your energy and effort into knowing it or him or her instead of God, it is an idol. Years ago, I went to this church. and It was a very small congregation. And I was standing there in worship, and the Lord gave me a word for this man that was in the church. And he was Native American or part Native American. And so I made my way over to him, and I knelt down before him. He was sitting down. And I said, Sir, God has given me a word for you. And I said, You're called to preach the gospel. And he looked at me, and he said, I know. I said, Well, why aren't you doing it? And he said, um, he said Because my people won't accept me if I do it. He's talking about the Native American people. And I said, God said that he would give you dreams and visions and they will believe. They, they will accept you. And he said, no, my people won't accept me if I preach the gospel. He refused the call God put on his life because he preferred the favor of his Native people. That is idolatry. It could not be a more classic case of idolatry than that. It grieved me. I prayed for him for a long time after that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Psalm 16, 4. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. So idolatry multiplies your sorrows. I don't think any of us need any more of that. I want to read y'all two words that I came across uh, from the past that the Lord has given us about idolatry. This first one is extremely profound. It's dated November 10th, 2020, and it's called Holding On to Idols. You know, we need we need reminders about idolatry all the time. All of us do. It is so easy to get into if we do not guard our hearts very carefully. Holding on to idols. When I return, will I find my children holding their idols and worshiping them? Will I find them pushing me aside to make more time for them? When will you recognize the God you worship is not me? Oh, the Lord said this. I got to interrupt the word for a, a minute. The Lord said this is a word for somebody. When will you recognize the God you worship is not me? Sir, you are involved with a woman and your worship is going to her. You worship her beauty and you worship the way she makes you feel. And the Lord says you need to stop doing that and you need to give him your worship or some very bad things are going to take place in your life. He's not telling me what the things are, but I see destruction coming. Sorry about the snoring in the background, y'all. That's my chihuahua. Okay, let's start over in this word, holding on to idols. When I return, will I find my children holding their idols and worshiping them? Will I find them pushing me aside to make more time for them? When will you recognize the God you worship is not me? When will you see that though you believe that your heart and thoughts and time belong to me, that is far from the truth? I am a great king and a mighty God. I am due the first of your time each and every day, yet you bring me the minutes left over from your busy days. Is the king of kings not due the first of your time, the majority of your thoughts, all of your heart? You ask me to honor you with my favor, yet you do not honor me. Okay, the next one's dated May 15th, 2020. It's called Cleanse the Idols. Cleanse the idols from your hearts, my children. Cleanse your hearts now that I am the only God you serve. In the times coming, many will forfeit their eternal souls and receive the mark of the beast as foretold in my holy word. Many will receive the mark that they may feed their idols, idols of husbands, of wives, of children and grandchildren. Do you yet love them more than me? When that time comes and they cry to you for food, how will you choose? Cleanse your heart of all idols, my children, while there is yet time, for there will be no time then to consider your decision as there is now. I will be first in your heart. If I am not first, who is really your God? You know, it's strange for us to think of idolatry as being something in the modern world, uh, as something that we deal with, but consider this.
There are actually people who worship crawling creatures. In a museum in Egypt, there is a monument to the scarab beetle. The Philistines actually worshipped flies. Hindus today won't swat a fly lest it be an ancestor of theirs paying for their wrongs. Today you find that there are 330 million gods of the Hindus. Eight gods for every person. In Thailand, there are 20,000 Buddhist temples. In one, there is a two-inch tooth supposedly saved from Buddha's funeral. In China, this is my favorite one. In China, a Buddhist statue actually fell on a man, and the family sued the Buddhas in the temple, and the statue was put on trial, found guilty, and it and 14 other statues were actually beheaded. So there you go. Idolatry in the modern world. Okay, now, I'm going to share with you a dream that I had. I can still see it. It was so powerful, and it was, I had it, I don't know, some months ago, two or three months ago, I think. I have, in the past, had a tendency to admire my son too much, almost to the point of idolatry sometimes. He is a very strong man of unusually high integrity, who spends all of his time helping others. He also has immense high IQ, so he is really good at problem solving, which is a huge help to me when he's around. But the fact that he has such incredibly high morals makes me more than proud of him. Many women do idolize their grown sons, and many fathers idolize their daughters, though we don't mean to, do we? One night, God gave me a dream about this. In this dream, I had actually begun idolizing him, and suddenly Jesus burst through the clouds to take us home. When he found me in idolatry, I was left behind. There I was, standing there, watching Jesus go the other way, back up into heaven, without me, and it was too late to correct. I still remember that awful feeling of regret when I realized I had been left behind to face the horrors of the tribulation. I don't want any of us to end up that way, y'all. None of us, because I knew. I knew what he was showing me. I knew what he was showing me in that dream. He was saying, hey, you or anybody else that gets into idolatry, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be left behind. We need to examine our hearts so very carefully about this. There are many people and things we can idolize. And many times, maybe even most of the time, we don't even realize we're doing it. The Lord, I would never be in idolatry on purpose. I know you wouldn't either. The Lord, our God, will have no other gods in our hearts. Not children, not grandchildren, not a star athlete or a sports player, not celebrities, not careers, not possessions. And more people worship their possessions than you might think. The guy with the classic hot rod car that he constantly washes and waxes. The woman with the beautiful collection of jewelry she's always looking at. Not wealth, not prestige, not godly parents, not pastors, not churches, not kingdom spouses, not godly marriages. None. None means none. Okay? I will have no other gods means no other gods. Isaiah 2.18, the idols he shall utterly abolish. Now I want you to look at Exodus 12.12. I want to show you something. Because I never noticed this said this before. This is talking about God going through Egypt and taking the firstborn. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Now listen to this part. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Let me read that again. Exodus 12, 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. That confirms Isaiah 2, 18. Do you see how it confirms it? The idols he shall utterly abolish. He will execute judgment on your idols. So that's something to think about, okay? We have to remember, he is a jealous God. That's one of his names is jealous. He's jealous of our love. He's jealous of our devotion. He is very jealous for our worship. Idols come to take you into captivity. They will make you their slave. You know, God carries us when we worship him. But if you're in idolatry, 
you will quickly become a slave to whatever or whoever you are idolizing, and then you will carry them. The Lord gave me that dream to illustrate something I was not seeing, that idolatry in any form can cause us to be left behind when he comes for his bride. And we don't know when he's coming, remember. He will have a bride without spot or blemish. And I think this means we all need to take a good hard look at our hearts and search for any hidden idols there. Nobody wants to be left behind in what is coming. It is going to be a horror show, and you're going to be in it if you're left here. It's going to be a time of lawlessness and evil taking over the land. It's going to be horrible. So let's talk about, in closing, what idolatry causes in our lives, according to Scripture. According to 2 Chronicles 24, 18, idolatry separates you from God. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Ezekiel 14, 5, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Number two, idolatry will trap you. Psalm 106, 36, and they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Snare here comes from the Hebrew word, I don't know how to say that, M-O-Q-E-S, which means a noose or a hook for the nose, a trap. Idolatry is just one more trap the enemy will try to set for you. Remember, the enemy desires your worship, and he desires your devotion. He wants to take it from God. He tried to trap Jesus with the same thing when Jesus was weak from fasting in the wilderness in Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I want to tell you all something. When I lived in McKinney, When I was married to my children's father, we lived in McKinney. (laughs) And there was one time, oh, y'all, we were so broke. Oh, my gosh, we just didn't make very much money. Neither one of us had a college education, and we just didn't make any money. And I was, for a time, driving a, a very oxidized silver gremlin automobile, and the back window was duct taped together, and the brakes were out. I can't make this stuff up, okay? That's all we could afford. And I worked every day in McKinney. I had to drive back and forth from Princeton. And I remember one day in McKinney stopping at a stop sign and seeing this beautiful, I don't know, it was like a Monte Carlo SS or some really nice car go past and, and thinking how pretty it was. And I heard the devil speak to me. And he said, I'll give you a car like that if you fall down and worship me. I can't make this up. And I said, I rebuke you, Satan. There is no way, no way I'm going to worship you. No way. But he will actually speak to you and try to make deals with you. Don't think he won't, because he will. Okay, number three, idolatry will involve you to the point you are willing to sacrifice your family. Psalm 106, 38. And if you don't think that's true, look at the men who have gotten into affairs and women who have gotten into affairs who have left their families to be with the person that they send with. Psalm 106, 38, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Number four, your idolatry can cause your children to also become idolaters. Second Kings 21, 21, and he walked in all the way that his father walked in, and served the idols that his father served, and worshiped them, referring to Ammon, son of King Manasseh. Number five, idolatry will cause you to be confounded and bring you to shame. Confounded in Psalm 97, 7 comes from the root Hebrew word BOS. I don't know how to say it. A primitive root meaning to be ashamed, disappointed, or delayed. To bring to shame, cause shame, put to shame, be confounded, confuse. Psalm 97, 7, confounded be all they that serve graven images that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all ye gods. Dictionary.com further defines confound as to throw into confusion or disorder, to treat or regard erroneously or mix by mistake, and the archaic meaning of the same word is to bring to ruin. 
Also, if you see Isaiah 45, 16, they shall be ashamed and also confounded. All of them, they shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. Number six, finally, idolatry multiplies your sorrows. Their sorrows, what verse is this? Psalm 16, 4. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. We live in the time of sorrows as it is, and things are deteriorating by the day. None of us needs more sorrow. Let's remember, y'all, Isaiah 2.18, And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And remember another thing. And this is true in every case. Idolatry will always cost you something precious you can never get back. I hope this podcast helps each of you to give serious consideration to what is in your heart and anyone or anything that may be an idol in your life. Any person that influences you in any way or that you care about so much you are unwilling to do what God has called you to do, that's a problem, okay? I'm just telling you. That is, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. Any of us can be called home any night, any day. We need to consider these now, not later. Now, while we can still make changes. We don't want to be standing there like I was in that dream, devastated to see Jesus going the other way and not be going with him. Because soon, very soon, we're going home to our king. Or we can be left behind here if we want to stay in sin. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. I hope this has inspired you to a closer walk with Christ. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc. P.O. Box 854 Altus, Oklahoma. That's A L T U S, Oklahoma 73522. Or by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Listen to Just Praise Him Radio on WINB, 4 p.m. Eastern on Sundays and 9 p.m. Eastern Thursdays each week. Does your life feel like it's falling apart around you? Are multiple things going wrong all at once? Does it seem all your comforts have been stripped away? You may have entered the wilderness. Wilderness experiences are often times of great discomfort and lack. Every Christian must pass through the desert on the way to their promised land. Find out how to go from surviving to thriving by partnering with God as He leads you in the path that will strengthen your faith and prepare you to step into your destiny. The Wilderness Companion will help you find out why you have been led into the wilderness. Find out the biggest hindrances to receiving the provision you need in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Learn how to partner with God in His purposes for you in the desert seasons. Get your copy of The Wilderness Companion today. The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, or audiobook. Are there areas of sin in your life you just can't seem to overcome no matter how hard you try? Many people live their whole lives under curses without understanding they can be free. Learn what the scriptures say about curses and why they are still relevant today. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Learn how to defeat every curse through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. If you have the knowledge, you can break curses off your life and start experiencing breakthroughs like never before. In the book, Loosed from Chains of Darkness, you will learn the basics of four different types of curses. Loosed from Chains of Darkness is the most comprehensive curse-breaking book on the market today. Get your copy of Loosed from Chains of Darkness by Glenda Lomax, available on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, and audiobook versions.